At the start of the 1960s, test cricket was in the doldrums. Slow over rates, negative play and controversy over illegal bowling actions had seen cricket become rather dull. The arrival of a charismatic West Indies team in the summer of 1960-61 changed all that. Oh, Mr. Worrell, perhaps you could give us some idea of what sort of cricket you intend to play on this tour. Well, actually, um, well, the natural cricket of the, of the West Indians is an um, attractive cricket and we shall sort of endeavour to permit the boys to play the natural game. This sizzling straight drive takes the score past the 100 and even Benno had to applaud the brilliance of Garfield Soap. And we were so fortunate that we had two captains who had a similar idea that began to play cricket regardless to what the results was going to be. A whole bumper, a vigorous hook shot, an obvious ball, 18 runs required. The selectors will be looking in kindly fashion on any players who play the game in what we might term the right way. Sobers the bowler, Benno plays the ball to mid-wicket. They start down the pitch and Davidson is run out by a visit magnificently turned from Solomon. Here we have two captains that wanted to play a game and, and we, we got to a situation where we had, we had wonderful cricket, wonderful attitudes, uh, relationships between teams um, and I think it, it engendered a tremendous influence on how test cricket would be played in the future. The 1960-61 Test Series between Australia and the West Indies is universally regarded as the greatest Test Series ever played. The two captains, Richie Benno and Frank Worrell, led from the front and all the players responded accordingly. The first Test in Brisbane saw a sensational finish. With victory in sight, Australia lost three quick wickets. When only two balls remained in the match, scores were tied. Australia needed one run, the West Indies one wicket. I thought to myself, how will I feel now if Wes bowls a no ball? And that means Australia win a test with one ball to go. I can see the headlines. So as he walked past me with the ball going back to his bowling mark, I said, Wes, don't forget your so-and-so foot. And he looked at me and grinned. I thought he was being very nice to me, but now that I, in retrospect, I believe all the guy is so cunning, he would probably didn't want to call me. All will bow decline. And here's the single that wins the match for Australia. He's out, he's right out. Right out. Right out. Right out. Right out. the sound down. <laughs> History was made when, for the first time, a test match ended in a tie. We were stunned, I think, that the, the result um, uh, was a tie. And, and it happened so quickly. You know, well, we lost those wickets so quickly in the last, uh, um, second last over and last over. Uh, I wouldn't like to make any forecasts on the possible outcome of the series, but I'm hoping that we play attractive cricket throughout. And it does seem that um, both teams are prepared to play it. And um, the spectators should benefit. Richie? Probably I think they might all be ties. <laughs> <laughs> Under the inspirational leadership of the two captains, Benno and Worrell, Australia and the West Indies played attractive cricket and the crowds lapped it up. There was another nail-biting finish in the fourth test in Adelaide when last wicket pair Lindsay Klein and Slasher Mackay battered through the final session and managed to force a draw. Ball bells it and Mackay's hit high up in the body, it's all over! It's a draw! It's a draw! A world record crowd of 90,800 packed into the Melbourne cricket ground to witness the series deciding fifth test. There were moments of high drama. The bail is on the ground and Alexander is certain that Grout has been bowed and the umpires decide to hold a conference. They rule not out to the amazement of the West Indians. The decision of the two umpires is this, that neither of us could tell why that bail was up. 
In the end, Australia just snuck home to win the series. But it was cricket that was the real winner. Symbolic of the moment, a perpetual trophy was named in honour of the visiting captain, Frank Worrell, the first black man to captain the West Indies on tour. The World Trophy um, is very symbolic. It is symbolic of two great teams meeting and playing the best cricket that they can play. And uh, much to the and, and the, the the crowd receiving that cricket with approbation, you know, it didn't matter if you were West Indian or Australian. The West Indies recorded the unprecedented honour of a ticker tape farewell. Over half a million people turned out in the streets of Melbourne just to say thank you. They may have lost the series, but they had won the hearts of the Australian public. It was a triumph for Frank Worrell. He had managed to unify the diverse nature of West Indies cricket into one cohesive force. It was not only a success, it was a huge success. If it had failed, the setback for West Indian cricket development would have been enormous. Um, but the, the success of it, on the other side, meant that it was established then, that uh, you know, West Indies would, would always then have a captain picked on merit and uh, picked as, whether you're professional, amateur, blue, white, black, brown, whatever, that the captain would always be picked on merit. Australia's next assignment was to win an Ashes series on English soil for the first time since Bradburn's Invincibles in 1948. One new member of the touring party was a 24-year-old opening batsman from Victoria by the name of William Morris Laurie. I made 266 against New South Wales, but then I went to Queensland and Dudley Seddon went up there, and I'm sure he went up there to have a bit of a second look, and I got 130, or I think, up there and, and got selected to go to the England 61 as a third opener. Laurie's roommate on tour was a 19-year-old Leviathan from Western Australia by the name of Graham Mackenzie. The teenage fast bowler's strapping physique saw him nicknamed Garth after the English comic strip superhero. The first time we met up in Melbourne, it was really, there were four or five of the players that uh, I'd, I hadn't met previously, and they definitely hadn't seen me uh, play. And None of us had met him. We didn't even know who he was, or who he looked like. And then all of a sudden we saw this bike walking up the gangplank, like man breaks later sort of thing. Uh, magnificent physique and the whole thing, and thought, goodness gracious. His mother uh, was uh, on the ship seeing him off, and um, she said to me, Mr. Benno, could I ask you please to look after Graham? It's his first tour away and um, he may well be lonely. And, you know, I'd really appreciate it if um, you could make sure he's looked after. And I looked over Mrs. Mackenzie's shoulder and there was Garth, surrounded by 28 nubile young ladies and I said to Mr. McKenzie, I don't think there's going to be a problem for him. After the first test was drawn, both Laurie and McKenzie found themselves playing together in the Australian side for the first time in the second test at Lords. Captain Richie Benno was forced to miss the Lords test because of a shoulder injury. I was having treatment when the second test came along at Lords, but um, at practice the afternoon before, I talked to Harv and to Colin McDonald, who was the third selector, and uh, I said, I'm not going to be fit enough to, uh, to play. With Benno out, Neil Harvey, who had been waiting in the wings for five years, finally fulfilled his dream to lead his country. He said, you got the job, you're captain. And I felt sorry for him because he'd never captained Australia at Lords. And I'm sure he'd been every captain's wish who leads their country as a captain at their own country at Lords. And he can't play. Now I felt so sorry for him. For Bill Laurie, his dream also became a reality. To walk down the long run with Col McDonald, who was also one of my heroes, um, was just a wonderful feeling because we got a hostile reception when we got on the pitch with uh, Truman and Statham. Bill Laurie, a very 
very fine cricketer and uh, uh, his innings at Lord's on the Battle of the Ridge was one of the greatest innings I've ever seen. They called the Battle of the Ridge because on a good length there was a drain quite close to the surface of the pitch and it went laterally across. And if the ball happened to hit the bowler side of the ridge, it might hit you under the, the chin. If it happened to hit the ridge on the batting side of the ridge, you could get whacked in the ankle. Oh, that's a nice stroke. Coming down to the grandstand, Fuller won't catch that. Now, Bill Laurie maintains it's not his best test innings. I maintain it. it's the best innings he's ever played in his life. He took so many whacks on the body from Truman and Statham that it's not funny. That's it. That's his hundred. It was certainly emotional. To get a hundred at Lords is something you dream about, you know. You listen on the radio as a boy and to do it also when Neil Hover as captain was also a special buzz for me. When he came off, he was black and blue. He'd never taken a backward step. He's on his first tour, and it was quite one of the most brilliant things I've ever seen, and one of the most courageous. Mackenzie to Murray. Attempted a hook, and he's out. Young Graham Mackenzie, 20 years of age, playing his first test match, bowling into the ridge, gets five for 37. Terrific performance. I was so pleased for him. Oh, that's the end of the innings. Lock, clean bowl by Mackenzie. To walk through that long room, whether you're going out to bat or uh, coming in after a great success uh, is a great thrill and one of the traditions of cricket. Uh, much easier when you've got five wickets than when you haven't scored any runs. Two needed to win. And there they are. Fine hook from a short ball. And they have won second test match here at Lords. That result to me was one of the most satisfying moments in my test life. To Captain Australia, number one. To Captain Australia at Lords, number two. To Captain Australia at Lords and win, number three. And I can assure you we had quite a bit of verve clicker that night to celebrate. After Australia's victory in the second test at Lords, England squared the series at Headingley, thanks to an 11 wicket haul by fast bowler Fred Truman. And appeal and he's LBW. Early on the last morning of the fourth test at Old Trafford, Australia was in trouble, leading by only 157 runs when last man in, Graham McKenzie, joined Alan Davidson. Only hit him high into the outfield. For six. And he hits that one very hard indeed for four runs. He hits that high. For six. And it hit the brick wall that separates the ground from the railway yards at Manchester. Went over mid off, and it's as good a hit as I've ever done in my life. I probably at that time didn't realise the significance of it. Uh, it was. Uh, to put on 98 runs for the last wicket and all of a sudden had a target to be able to uh, set for England to chase. Thanks to Davidson and Mackenzie's valuable partnership, England were set a target of 256 runs to win. With Ted Dexter in full flight, England looked unbeatable at one for 150. Ooh, hit him into the crowd now. Magnificent shot over long arm. There's no doubt we're going to win this test match. And suddenly, Richie Benno went round the wicket. Now, I do believe that Richie Benno had been talking to Ray Linwell. I'm thinking of bowling around the wicket to the right hand, left handers. Ooh, he said, well, he said, he said, I've never known anyone to do that. And I said, no, no, nor have I. Well, he said, if, if you're in trouble, I suppose, he said, bear in mind, if you're bowling at the right-handers, you can only do it if they're attacking you because they'll defend with their pads and they can't be out of W. But, oh, he said, if you do it, make sure you've got 
the right field set for the right batsman, but do it well, otherwise they'll kill you. Having recovered from his shoulder injury, Richie Benno put his plan into effect. He's caught behind the wicket. Dexter caught behind by Groudoff Benno for 76. He's bowled May behind his legs, has he? Yes, he's out. Bowled behind his legs. Now he's hit him for six. Yes, he's gone for six. And he's caught behind square leg. He's clean bowled. Saburo bowled. Yes, he's caught by Simpson at slip. I'd never seen a leg break bowler bowl around the wickets before. Uh, it wasn't something that we'd seen in uh, Australia. Richie Benno took six wickets for 70, and England lost their last nine wickets for just 51 runs. Team ball, Australia have won and they've kept the ashes. They've won by 54 runs. Congratulations to Australia, to Richie Benno and his men. It was great when more of the fact that we won the guys that lost in 1956 there. Um, when Lanka got 19 wickets um, on that tour, they were quite emotional, you know, the senior players. Neil Harvey got a pair in that test match in 1956. Richie and they just stood on the balcony. 2-1, you're not going to lose the series with one to go. So it was quite an emotional time for them. All I'll be doing is trying to get as many wickets as I can, not just for myself, but for Australia uh, and Victoria when we're playing in the Shield matches. Ian Meckiff had been a central figure in the debate that raged over illegal bowling actions in the late 1950s. This simmering controversy was brought to boiling point in the summer of 1963-64 when, after having been overlooked for nearly three years, Meckiff was surprisingly recalled to the Australian side for the first test against South Africa in Brisbane. A lot of people said I changed my action, but I, I didn't change my action. All I did was ran in with a, a stiffer left arm rather than cocking it as you run in like a normal action. The accusations were flying that Australia were fuelled by a lot of illegal bowlers and uh, it had to stop. Now, Don Bradman, who cared so much about the game of cricket in general terms, uh, took the lead and with Guppy Allen over in London, um, they got their heads together and tried to sort out a, a means of um, eradicating this from the game. Bradman himself said that throwing is the most vexed issue in the game because two men of goodwill can look at the same action and come up with diametrically opposed opinions. At the Adelaide Oval, there was a meeting called by the Australian Cricket Board, of which Sir Donald Bradman chaired, and District cricket umpires at the senior level were invited. They were great captains there, all the state team, and that type of player and umpire who were heavily involved in the game. And the request, it wasn't an instruction, a request from the chairman, who was Sir Donald, was to all of us that this illegal bowling was becoming too prevalent. It was a, a nuisance to the game, it had been also um, in the game in the round the turn of the century and um, if possible cricket would like the help of players and umpires to do something about it. There was definitely from 1960 an idea that players with illegal actions had to be eliminated from the game. So there was a, a general cast of mind among administrators and among umpires that specific action had to be taken. And if that involved no balling a player in a test match or in a first class game, then uh, that, that was deemed to be necessary. I realised that the responsibility, to an extent, I knew what the law was, I knew what illegal bowlers were about, and I thought to myself, well, looks as though I'll have to become involved in it, which I did. Meckhoff was brought back, and that was a surprise uh, to me, because I'd had absolutely no indication that Mech was going to be chosen again. And um, at the cocktail party the night before the game, the most significant thing uh, I thought happened, I didn't, uh, I didn't labour the point with anyone, but I made a, a point myself of going to the three different corners of the room where the mayoral reception was being held, just so as I could say hello to the selectors. 
who normally would be having a drink together. Jack Ryder didn't drink anyway, but uh, he'd be having a, a soft one. But there they were in the three corners of the room. Didn't speak a word to one another all night. So um, I knew that there was a possibility that something was going to happen here. You, you don't suddenly have a, a guy brought back into the side. The selector's not talking. I even had drinks with uh, Colin Egar the night before. So there was, there was no real... F I, I did not really think anything was going to happen. Definitely not. Well, um, we heard that they were going to call him. I don't know how, but we got to hear that they were going to call him and they'd call him out. And uh, that seemed sad to do it that way. If you had said to me before the game, uh, do you think Mekif is going to be called? We'd said yes. Yeah, well, and I think our whole side f felt that. Australia batted first and scored 435. Brian Booth top scored with 165. When the South African innings commenced, Graham McKenzie bowled the first over. And then Ian Mekif prepared to bowl from what was ironically called the Vulture Street End. As Mekif ran in and delivered his second ball, it happened. A cry of, no ball, no ball, no ball rang out. No ball, no ball. Ian Mekif had been called for throwing. I was at square leg to the second over, and uh, of course I did uh, call Ian because, in my opinion, um, of what the law stated and uh, what I was looking at was um, illegal. And uh, it's a... Uh, not as simple as that, but that's what happened, I'll put it that way. When Cole did call me, um, I suppose, I, I, I didn't quite know where it had come from, and I don't think anybody really knew where the call came from, uh, which is always, it's a little bit disconcerting when you, you hear something and you're not quite sure what's happened. To judge what you see at the time. There's no such thing as premeditating what you're going to do, and that's the way that uh, you do do it. Umpire Colin Egar judged the second, third, fifth and ninth deliveries of Ian Mekif's over to be illegal and repeated the call of no ball. It was very awkward facing that over because um, I didn't know if I played a rash shot and got out whether they would give that one as a fair ball or not. Um, so with thousands shouting and screaming and had no ball here and there, it was a bit difficult. I just felt um, numb. I said, the thing to do is get through this over and just make sure that you're not called again. I knew that I was in trouble one way or the other, but I must admit I didn't realise that I wouldn't be bowling again, not until Richie told me. My position is that if any of my bowlers is ever no balled, I won't bowl him again in the match. There was a lot of boos going on, a lot of jeers, and whenever I fielded the ball, uh, everybody cheered. I think I took a catch somewhere during that day, and they, they, they really, everybody just cheered me. However, there was a classic piece of dressing room humour that brought some light to a very dark situation. I had a bit of a word to the um, room attendant, and we got this gun and a water pistol or something, and I got his gear and a raincoat on and put a hat on. Richie, as the captain, um, people were blaming him. I don't know how he got blamed in on, on the whole thing, but they were blaming everyone. And uh, I, I think Bill sort of played the part of the assassin. Richie was sitting there having morning tea. Well, Richie having morning tea is watching cordon bleu meal being eaten. You know, he, he eats the biscuit and little bites and a little chew and a little drink put the raincoat on and huddle up and put his, pull his hat down and go in with a toy gun and point it at Benno. And he said, I've got you, I'm going to shoot you. And Benno went white. And I said something like, you should have bowled him at both ends, Benno, and went bang with the gun. Well, the look, you know, it was one of those looks that only which you can give you anyway. And I, it sort of added a bit of lightness to an ordinary test match, but I think I did field a final leg and third man for the rest of the test match. But... And Bill Lowry ran out of the room laughing that much, he, he couldn't move. But it was a very funny experience and that, that, broke, that broke the thing up a little bit. There has always been speculation about whether there was some sort of conspiracy. Was Ian Meckiff set up to be thrown out of the game? There was Bradman, there was Benno and there was myself. And I can tell you that there was never any discussion between the three of us at any stage. I've never ever spoken to uh, Richie Benno about it. Jack Ryder, who was a Victorian, select, uh, Victorian selector and also 
an Australian selector, he was there and he came to me and he said, look, um, we, got a, we really have a, a major problem with you. We, we need to know whether you want to play for Victoria in the next game in Melbourne. But he said, remember that unfortunately with what's happened, uh, we won't be able to, you won't be able to play in any of the other states other than Victoria if you want to keep playing Shield cricket. I decided really that there was no future in me playing cricket. So I retired. Somebody should have answered to that, and I think the Australian um, selectors have got a lot to answer for for that because it was a strange call to wait to a test match to call him. Ian Meckiff, I guess, was the chief sacrificial lamb in this campaign to eradicate illegal actions. It's something that's still with us. It'll never go away, and especially under the redefinition by the... ICC. With the new rule that's around, that Colony, Colony Gar said there would be no problems with my action if I was both playing today, <laughs> which I thought was rather good. It's a little bit late though, isn't it? <laughs> Ian Meckiff's last test also turned out to be Richie Benno's last test as Australian captain. He missed the second test against South Africa because of injury and stood down in favour of Bob Simpson. We were sort of trying to regroup after our great period in cricket. We were looking for replacements for, for some of the senior players who were retiring, the Davos, the Linwells, and eventually uh, Richie also. And uh, uh, Harvey had gone, Slash and Mackay had gone, so there was a lot out. So it was a vital, really serious for us, and South Africa had a very good team. In the fourth test in Adelaide, South Africa inflicted Australia's heaviest defeat on home soil since 1936 thanks to a record third wicket partnership of 341 runs between Eddie Barlow and 19-year-old left-hander Graham Pollock. Eddie and I put on that 341 and I think it was only 280 minutes. Suddenly there was a brand new spirit within the whole of Siphon Cricket. I think it was the transformation in, in Siphon Cricket. Um, it changed things, it was a fantastic Two hours we actually had the, the, the Saturday night where Eddie and I put on 180 in the last session. But it was just to be part of it. I love playing in Adelaide. In fact, uh, through my career, it was a place probably that I got runs every time I played there. Although the series was drawn, the young emerging South African side had the better of Australia. In the fifth test in Sydney, Richie Benno made his last appearance in test cricket. And this was the last ball of his last over. At one minute past six on Wednesday evening, Richie Benno left the field of international sport. Although this fine all-rounder and former captain has retired from first-class cricket, Richie Benno hopes he may still be of service to the sport which he played so well. I'd like to remain in some form of, uh, of cricket. I wouldn't like to lose touch with it. I think perhaps that with the experience I've gleaned over the last few years that I may be able to provide uh, some benefit to Australian cricket. The side that Bob Simpson took to England in 1964 was labelled by the English press as the worst team ever. The Australians defied the critics by winning the third test at Headingley, thanks to a match-winning innings of 160 by Peter Burge. Supported by tail-end batsman Neil Hawke and Wally Grout, the last three wickets added 211 runs. Burgey came in at a time when the game could have gone either way and he just played brilliantly. He was always a great hooker and that's strange for such a big, big man. And uh, he also drove well and it was, it was his innings of his life. In the next test, it was Bob Simpson's turn. Although Simo had been a prolific run scorer in first class cricket, he had to wait seven years and 51 innings to score his maiden test century. Relief. Total relief. It was a very emotional time for me, but I'd always promised myself once I got at 100, I'd get a biggie. I'd always promised myself. Simpson batted for 12 hours and 42 minutes and turned his maiden test century into a triple century. Simpson, 296. And that's it, 300 to Bobby Simpson. Being one up in the uh, series at that stage, and uh, knowing that uh, if we, uh, you know, we perform well, we we're going to end up, you know, uh, bringing back the Ashes, and I think that was the big thing. You know, the fact that we wanted to play them right out of the game if we possibly could. 
Bob Simpson's marathon innings ensured Australia retained the Ashes. There were more records broken in the final test at the Oval. England's Fred Truman created history by becoming the first bowler in test cricket to take 300 wickets. The Wembley roar returns. Truman to Hall. He's caught by Cowdery and Truman has taken his 300th wicket in test matches. Frank Nicklin, who was the editor of the, the, the People the newspaper, who I worked for for 40 odd years, uh, he said, make sure you get your through the test wicket on the Saturday. I said, you can't do a thing like this to order, I'm sorry. He said, well, we want it Saturday if we can get it, he said. He said, then I can have the big spread in the paper, which of course I did it on the Saturday afternoon. Do you think anyone else will ever do it? I don't know. Uh, there's one thing, if I do, I'll be tired when they're finished. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the rec records are made to be broken, so... Uh, records are made to be broken, so... Uh, I suppose somewhere in the distant future somebody might come along and do it. And if I do, uh, then I'll just as big a thrill for them. Australia journeyed to the Caribbean in 1965 to face a strong West Indies team who had defeated England, in England, in 1963. Frank Worrell had retired from international cricket and handed over the captaincy to Gary Sobers. The captain of the West Indies team and the follow in the footsteps of a player like Sir Frank Worrell. It was a great honour. It was something that I really never expected because I'd never captained any team before. I wasn't even vice-captain in any team before. We were all around 24, 25 and, you know, at the height of our, our powers. And yet, we had not played one single test match in two years. And we were eager to go, perhaps more eager than Australia. And um, Sobers as captain, again, making a good impression, leading, young enough to lead by example. The Australian players who had faced Wesley Hall in 1960-61 knew what to expect. But this time, he had a new ball partner, a fearsome fast bowler with a controversial action by the name of Charlie Griffith. Charlie Griffith had a, a controversial action. There was no question about it. Uh, he, not only the Australians queried it, the Englishmen did as well. There were territories in the Caribbean um, who were not too sure um, whether he was throwing or not. Tony Cozier still considered him the most dangerous bowler ever to play for the West Indies. He thinks he was the quickest, the most dangerous. I don't think many of the Australians were very happy because they came up against a bowler who was very quick and very dangerous. Charlie had one of the best bouncers in the business. I think he was an extraordinary strong man and he was very intimidating. That's, that's the problem. He was very intimidating. They couldn't pick him up and um, he could bowl nearly all day. You see, when a bowler is at you all day, it's a little intimidating. They were a wonderful combination because you had Wes who was all tearing and you had Charlie who sauntered in and let him go and uh, was lethally quick and to right hand he'd bowl the bouncer and he'd yorked and knocked the stumps out of the ground. He was just a, he was a wonderful bowler, Charlie. There was nothing about it. He was quick. Did you think he threw? When you get somebody that's a bit different, I don't think you can cry chuck I think, you know, if the laws of the game permit him to bowl, you just got to live with it. We were uh, concerned that we'd sorted out our throwing problems here in Australia and that had taken a lot of heartache. We went to the West Indies and everywhere we went they were all copying Charlie Griffiths. I think Charlie had an unusual action, delivery and it was taken in the wrong vein by lots of people. I played against him, I played with him and I'd always believed that he was fair. Anyone that says they are not scared of a really express fast bowler, I think is telling fibs. I really don't think you can possibly bat against someone like that without a fear factor. Now that's not a bad thing. You'll get the adrenaline pumping, your reflex will move quicker. And in this regard, you know, uh, the, the chuckers are the hardest to pick up. They're the ones who can nail you every now and then. Charlie got me in the West Indies. Uh, I missed, he missed me for most of the time, so he got me on the cheek. Poor old Lance Gibb ran in from going and said, are you all right? And I pushed him away. We said, if Lance is watching this, I apologise. I shouldn't have done that. But, you know, when you get 10 or 12 in the first three or four overs, you don't really want any apologies. But the West Indies did not always have things all their own way. In the fourth test in Bridgetown, Barbados, Australia's great opening pair, Bob Simpson and Bill Laurie, put on a record opening stand of 382. He almost treads on his wicket, but he gets a four. Simpson is on 199. 
Off they go for a single, and that's a double century to Bob Simpson. Rory's score has reached 199 as he faces Gibbs. A fine double century to Bill Lowe. This is one of the very rare occasions on which both opening batsmen have passed 200. It was a good pitch and we batted well. We made the mistake we were throwing our hands away when we got to 200. I mean, that's where we made the mistake. We started to do silly things we should have went on. This is the last ball of the fourth test between Australia and the West Indies at Bridgetown Barbados. The match finishes in a draw and the West Indies has won the series to take out the Sir Frank Worrell Trophy. The result of this series has altered the course of cricket history because for the first time a team other than England and Australia can claim the title of world champion. For the first time in the 60s, we could be called world champions. And the people of the West Indies, as I said, they, they received that with great approbation. They loved the idea. And it meant a lot to the people in the Caribbean that, to know that our cricket team was number one. Of course, in everything else, you were third world, but in cricket, the West Indies were first world, and that, that really meant a lot to people here, psychologically. Here was I taking over the helm and winning the first series that a West Indies team has ever won against Australia. That was something that I've always gone down in my memory and I've always th thought very highly of that. And it wasn't a weak Australian team either. It was a very, very strong Australian team. The Wanderers Johannesburg is the venue for the first test. Captains Peter van der Merwe and Bobby Simpson toss up and it's van der Merwe who wins and decides to take first knock. Australia toured South Africa in the summer of 1966-67. In 64 years of competition between the two countries, Australia had never lost a match on South African soil. That was all about to change. We'd just been to England in, in 65, and we'd won the series there. And uh, it was the start of what turned out to be five or six of the greatest years in South African cricket history, well, almost the legendary times. Dennis Lindsay enters the picture and immediately sets about stabilising the position. Lindsay was the man for the moment and he applied himself to the task with determination. Dennis Lindsay if ever the performances of one player influenced the outcome of a series, it was South Africa's wicketkeeper, Dennis Lindsay. Spearheading a rearguard action when the game was in the balance, his innings of 182 turned the match in South Africa's favour. Lindsay's 182 was the highest played in a test on the Wanderers Stadium and also the highest ever by a South African wicketkeeper and made him the hero of the day. Dennis Lindsay wasn't a renowned batsman, but during that season was that year that was just meant for Dennis Lindsay, I think, and he couldn't do anything wrong. And uh, he certainly changed the fate of uh, the test coming in the middle order there. South Africa's moment of history had finally arrived. Their first victory over Australia on home soil. Mackenzie is caught by Proctor off Goddard, whose great bowling is seldom seen in a lifetime of cricket. He took six vital wickets for 53 runs. South Africa win by 233 runs. This truly was one of South Africa's finest hours. And who could blame the jubilant crowds as they carried their heroes show the heart? The champagne flows as the Springboks and all South Africa rejoice at the historic win. 64 years is a long time to wait, but no victory has ever tasted better. Even as I talk about it, I, I sort of get a, a, a sort of chill up my spine. It was, it was a just a, a, a complete turnaround, what it did for South African cricket uh, from, from then on. And the beautiful part about it too was that it was, it was like South African cricket came from nowhere. Graham Pollock makes 209, the fourth highest individual score in all test cricket and the highest innings ever played at Newlands. In his magnificent knock, he hit 34s. Not even a masterful innings from the mercurial Graham Pollock could prevent Australia from winning the second test in Cape Town and levelling the series at one all. I must say, I mean, to get a double hundred and lose by eight wickets, so that's, that is a turnaround. However, South Africa went on to dominate the rest of the series. Dennis Lindsay continued on his merry way, amassing 606 runs at an average of 86, including three centuries and two fifties. 
In fading light, Lindsay continues his onslaught and this boundary takes his score to 95. And here's the Lindsay method of reaching his century. A six, Lindsay 101, his third century of the series. Dennis Lindsay was, uh, he just had a golden season. I mean, he couldn't put a foot wrong. And uh, I think they thought, the Aussies thought that they could get him out on the hook shot, which uh, was probably his strength in that series. Although he, he, he batted well all round. South Africa's emphatic 3-1 victory was its first series win over Australia in either country in 64 years of competition. Here all of a sudden we was a group of cricketers. We were the Cinderella's of, of world cricket. We'd never really beaten anyone of any consequence. And now we start. They were a better side than we were. You know, make no bones about it. They were one of the, the really fine cricket teams of all time. It wasn't until 1965 that Australia lost a series, a series, to any country other than England. Well, we'd lost on the mats in, uh, in Pakistan in 1956, but we'd never lost a series. And then in that period, in 1965, we lose to the West Indies, and in 1966-7, we lose to South Africa. So for the first time, Australian cricket is forced to depart from that, uh, that Anglo-Australian axis, which had been at the centre of, uh, of our game. And we were forced to realise that other countries could play cricket as well, if not better, than we could. Bob Simpson retired from Test cricket at the age of 32. Bill Laurie took over the Australian captaincy and led the team on the 1968 Tour of England. Things got off to a great start with Australia winning the first Test at Manchester by a margin of 159 runs. As the Australians celebrated their victory, the disappointed England batsman walking off the ground that day, Basil D'Oliveira, was soon to become the central figure in a volatile mix of sport, politics and world opposition to the policy of apartheid in South Africa. I believe in Lord, I've been given a great chance in England to play, to play cricket and eventually to play for England. Basil D'Oliveira was a Cape coloured cricketer from South Africa who had been denied the right to play first class cricket in the country of his birth. He moved to England, qualified to play county cricket and was eventually selected to play test cricket for his adopted country. When Dolavira played an impressive innings of 158 in the fifth test at the Oval, the England selectors faced a dilemma. With a tour of South Africa imminent, would the inclusion of Dolavira in the team place the entire tour in jeopardy? It was so much more than a cricket match. It was speaking of things that concerned international politics. It was shining a searing spotlight on the apartheid system in South Africa. Dolavira unwittingly became a central figure in both an off-field and an on-field drama. Australia was in a hopeless position at 5 for 85 at lunch on the final day of the Oval Test match. A torrential downpour flooded the ground and made a resumption in play highly unlikely. The ground was flooded and we went to lunch and I remember speaking to John Andrews and I just laughed and said, how lucky is this? And he just shook his head, you know, they were going to win. Obviously we were done, we were five out and done with three quarters of the day to go. And it rained and it rained and it rained. The ground was like Edwards Lake, was just a lake. And the sun came out. And I'll never forget a con crowd, he walked out with, no one of they knighted at him, um, with an umbrella and uh, walked across and spoke to the umpires. Next minute, out come all these spikes and they called the crowd onto the ground and the crowd actually spiked the ground. Half the crowd were out there sticking umbrellas in the outfield to try and get rid of the water. And the boys, the, the Aussie boys, were celebrating for retaining the ashes. With 75 minutes of game time left on the clock, the umpires declared the ground fit for play. Australia had managed to survive for over 40 minutes when the man of the moment, Dolivera, got the breakthrough. He's out. Well, there we are. There's the first wicket. Dolivera has got it. An involuntary sort of shot from Jarman. Seemed to me he was withdrawing his bat too late. England then brought on left arm spinner Derek Underwood, who was a specialist bowler in these conditions. He's out. Caught. Caught by Brown. Doesn't matter about the fours or sixes. Runs don't matter at all. was a better catch. Coming in round the wicket this time, Underwood. 
and he got him, bowled him, off stump, knocked out of the ground, and Australia are 120 for nine with just one wicket to go and ten minutes and a half left. Inverarity has been there for four hours, ten minutes, a superb innings for his country. Appeal, he's out! He's out, WW! England have won, and the series is drawn. Dolivera left the Oval, muttering under his breath, I did it. That'll show them. They must pick me now. And they didn't. There was outrage when Dolivera was left out of the England side to tour South Africa. However, when an original selection, Tom Cartwright, withdrew from the squad due to injury, Dolivera was named as his replacement. South Africa's Prime Minister, John Vorster, withdrew the invitation to the MCC and the tour was cancelled. There was an outcry. An outcry because a certain gentleman of colour was omitted on merit by the MCC Selection Committee. From then on, sir, Dolavera was no longer a sportsman, but a cricket ball. Well, I think it's a challenge to cricket that this has happened. Uh, probably didn't want it this way, but, but the game itself is going to suffer insofar that probably two of the greatest cricketing countries of the world will not be playing in a series. This is a great challenge that's come out of all of it. The team as constituted now is not the team of the MCC. It is the team of the anti-apartheid movement. Dolivera's place in history was assured far beyond uh, cricket terms. He was now a political figure of the first order and uh, before long South Africa truly were out in the cold. The whole world now saw the evil of the regime. It took a long time, but Dolivera was the cardinal figure. In the summer of 1968-69, the West Indies toured Australia. There were high hopes that this tour would recapture the magic of the 1960-61 series. The players were even driven in a motor cavalcade, as they had been at the conclusion of the previous tour. However, this great West Indian side that had come together under Frank Worrell, prospered under the leadership of Gary Sobers, and become world champions, was coming to the end of a great era. It was the end of an era. West Indies uh, in Australia 68-69, Hall, Griffith were on their last tours, and I think everyone knew it. I think we dropped something like 30 tests like 30 catches during that test series to Australia 10. And you can't afford to drop players like Ian Chappell, um, Stackpole, Bill Laurie, Red Path. It was not a United team on that tour and it showed in the field of play. Number of catches were dropped and that's always a sign when you start to drop catches in the fielding going down that uh, the team is not with it and it certainly wasn't. A good hook there from Chapel. There's no use chasing that one. Had it before runs. It was in this series that Ian Chapel really blossomed as a All test right. cricketer and showed himself to be a player of world class, batting in the pivotal number three position. Well, it's maybe maybe going down towards final. This will be century. Fielded by Nurse. The batsmen are through for two, and Chapel is one hundred. It was no no surprise to me that he turned out the type of player that he has been. And in my book, I think he's one of the best Australian batsmen that I've ever seen, Ian Chappell. He was a leader, certainly, um, just by pure ability for start. And because his bloodlines were good, if he was a racehorse, you'd want to buy him. He had good bloodlines, didn't he? Ian Chappell was the grandson of former Australian captain Victor Richardson. And he would eventually succeed Bill Laurie as Australian captain. There were times when both men didn't exactly see eye to eye. We got the situation where we were leading by about 340, I don't know what it was, and, uh, and uh, I had the option to send it to fall, and I walked off, and for once, I should have known better, come from Preston Tech to ask a guy from Prince Alfred College in Adelaide for advice for the first time, uh, what do you think we should do? And he said, I think we should send him back, and I said, sorry, we're batting again. He said, I'm going to give him 900 to get in a day and a half. And I said, well, Bill, 
on that basis, I think uh, you're wasting your time asking me for any further advice because it's obvious that we think polls are part on the game of cricket. And to his eternal credit, Bill never ever asked me for any advice ever again as, uh, as vice captain, and I was his vice captain for another mm, nine or ten test matches. Laurie was the kind of captain that was very relentless. You know, to give a team nearly 700 runs to win in a test match when you already won the series is, is, is a bit much. Australia won the series 3-1 and regained the Frank Worrell Trophy. In the fifth test in Sydney, Doug Walters, who in 1965 had scored a century on debut as a 19-year-old, created a further piece of test cricket history. They're going through. That's it. Doug Walters has done it. And you've seen something that has never happened before in more than 90 years of test cricket. A double century and a century in the one match. Doug Walters, 242 in the first innings, 100 not out. Well, Doug Walters was an incredible player. Um, I've said on many occasions uh, that I would hate to have ever toured with an Australian side that didn't have Doug Walters in it because it was not only what he contributed on the field but he contributed a lot off the field as well um, with his phlegmatic attitude and his dry sense of humour and he always kept the dressing room loose. In the summer of 1969-70 the Australian team needed every ounce of Doug Walters' phlegmatic attitude and dry sense of humour to help it get through an ill-fated double tour of India and South Africa. Australia won the series in India 3-1. Bill Laurie's side was the last Australian team to win on the subcontinent for 35 years. However, the players were forced to endure crowd riots, substandard accommodation and inadequate food. All the players on that 69-70 tour of India, then South Africa, felt that they'd been sold up the river by the administrators. I mean, the original tour was India, then Pakistan, which you could cope with that. I mean, it would have been a damn long tour, it would have been very testing, but at least the conditions would have been pretty similar. By 1970, uh, there's a general sense that players are not going to put up with the kind of indignities and, uh, and deficiencies that, uh, that they've put up with for the previous 20 years. And that double tour of India and South Africa, where, which exacts a fearsome physical toll on the players uh, in India, and then results in their receiving a conclusive drubbing in South Africa, and the complaints that, uh, that, that, that the players mustered afterwards. To me, it was a classic example of the administrators uh, just you know, never mind uh, the players, uh, let's take the money. Because I'm, I'm assuming, but I think I'd be fairly safe to assume that they got a very good guarantee to send the side to South Africa, you know, after the... Because the Pakistan leg of the tour got called off because of financial problems. Uh, they, Pakistan wouldn't guarantee the money outside, in currency outside of Pakistan. After their long tour of India, the Australians were tired and many were suffering from illness when they arrived in South Africa to play a four-test series. Australia faced a formidable Springbok lineup that was hungry for test cricket. The fallout from the Dolavira affair had seen them absent from the international arena for three years. You know, we were fighting to survive in world cricket. We had to be seen as a great side so that maybe other countries would still invite us because we were fighting the whole apartheid, uh, tours were being cancelled. South Africa thrashed Australia 4-0. It was the heaviest defeat ever inflicted on Australia in a test series. However, South Africa's greatest cricket triumph soon became its last hurrah. As the jubilant Springbok players walked off St George's Park in Port Elizabeth in March 1970, little did they realise that growing world opposition to the policy of apartheid meant it would be 22 years before South Africa would again play in a test match. No, we, we, we wouldn't have believed that. We, we, we would always have, have lived in, in, in hope. Uh, but at the back of our minds, we knew, uh, you know, something was up here. And uh, it, 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 it wasn't going to ease off. Um, the, the political pressures were, were getting more and more. To get any change in South Africa, you've got to affect the sporting side of the country. 
it's sports mad, and if they're not getting international sport, they're going to react somehow. And this is what happened. For the Australian players, the continued indifference of the administrators to their grievances was leading to an abiding sense of discontent. The Australian Cricket Board had agreed with the South African Cricket Board that, that, that the teams would play an extra test. It was a four test series that went out to a five. And the players said, no, it's not going to happen. They wanted us to play the fifth test. Uh, and we said, well, it's only fair that we get compensated to a much greater degree than we have been if we're going to stay on, because uh, they were making a lot of money out of the, the tour. Maybe Ian Chappell said, well, how much are they prepared to pay us? And the amount offered was ridiculous. And we said, well, that's it, we're not going to do it. That was the first evidence that the players had of their own bargaining strength, that they could withdraw their labour and that they could exert their will through that means. We've been treated badly and uh, as captain I felt responsibility, not to us so much because we were playing, but to the players in the future that were maybe going back to India again at some other stage and doing the double up again. Bill was going to write a letter to the board putting, listing all the things that we were annoyed about. And I remember saying to Bill, you know, when you write that letter, Bill, it's not just you that's annoyed with all these things, it's all of us. So, you know, we all should sign that letter, not just you, because if you sign it, you know, you'll be the one who's in the, in the gun sights. And I thought it was my responsibility, and of course, um, they didn't accept it very calmly. In fact, the late Ray Steele said, um, when I came back, if I'd have been manager, you wouldn't have sent that letter in. I said, Ray, that's the problem with you guys, you're not listening to what we're saying. And that was true. It took another five or six years for that to, uh, to come to fruition in, uh, in World Series cricket. But it's, I don't think it's any fluke that Ian Chappell was the person who led the rebellion in 1970 and was the man who was at the centre of World Series cricket in 1977. I wrote this letter saying we should never go under these conditions again, we should get paid better, we should have health insurance, we should have life insurance. And of course they didn't accept that letter very well. Um, but I'm glad I wrote it. Once I knew that Bill had given that letter to the board, signed only by himself, that was the only thing that worried me about Bill losing the captaincy because I, I had a pretty, by that stage, I had a pretty fair idea how the board worked. And if they decided that they wanted to get rid of somebody, it was just a matter of them waiting till he had a bit of a rough trot and boom, he'd be gone. I knew then I'd have to keep making runs, which was one of the things I failed to do consistently enough. But, um, well, if, it, if that was the reason the captaincy was numbered, um, it even makes the board look worse than what we thought they were. It didn't improve relations between the board and the players, that uh, 72 of South Africa. If Packer hadn't come, it wouldn't have changed. I've got no doubt about that. <laughs>